Thank you. Okay, so you know, why do we get excited about returning to play after sports concussion? Uh, particularly these days, uh, if you look, only probably 10 years ago, you see on TV people being concussed clearly and playing the same day and being praised in the media for being a brave soldier and keeping on playing. Well, the playing field's changed and the, and the, the attitudes towards concussion have changed a lot, so people are much more conservative these days. So why, why don't you go back to sport immediately after a sports-related concussion? Well, some of the possible reasons are that um, if you haven't recovered completely, your co coordination isn't up to scratch, and your decision-making isn't good. Does that put you at more risk of sustaining another concussion or another injury? If you have another concussion before you recover completely, it could be that you're, you enter this vicious cycle where you get concussed more easily, and it takes longer to recover. And we've all seen athletes who, see, over time, seem to get concussed more easily and take longer to recover. Obviously, the, in the past, the, a lot of attention has been paid to, to catastrophic brain injury after another injury, uh, so-called second impact syndrome, although there's been some debate about who, which groups of people that occurs in, but it certainly occurs to appear in adolescents or younger athletes. And in the press these days, a lot more interest on the long-term effects of concussion, particularly CTE, particularly in sports like the NFL, where there's a, there's a multi-billion dollar uh, lawsuit. And the one the coach is interested in, I suppose, is poor performance. So when is it safe, whatever that means, to return after sports-related concussion? Well, unfortunately, we haven't got a gold standard test for safety. We're not, we don't know whether it's safe to return once the athlete is clinically recovered. We don't know that it's only safe when they've covered from a neuropsychological point of view, neurobiological neurobiolo point of view, or there's some other factor that determines whether it's safe to return to play. We don't know about the long-term effects, whether it's cumulative for every concussion, no matter how small or how big, or whether it's just concussions over a certain severity, however you define that, that contribute to long-term effects or whether it's just if you have another concussion before you've completely recovered that causes long-term effects. So a lot of unknown things about return to sport after concussion. What we do know is that recovery times are individual. So on average, most recover within two weeks. Some people recover quicker than that, some people recur longer. And especially youth athletes tend to take a bit longer. And we know from tests that neurobiological recovery, which we don't normally test for, takes, can take longer than the clinical recovery. And the significance of this is unknown. We do know there are predictors for prolonged clinical recovery. So the worse your symptoms are in the first few days after the injury, the more likely you are to take longer to recover. We know that you develop a migraine, a new migraine or depression after a head injury, it's more likely to recover, more, to take more than one month to recover. And we know that children with a pre-existing migraine or depression are more likely to have a longer recovery of more than one month. You've heard quite a bit this morning about ways of assessing someone after a sports-related concussion. So you can do a clinical assessment, you look at symptoms, cognitive tests, balance, and a neurological, neuropsychological test. Having a baseline score and personally knowing the athlete may help pick up subtle changes that weren't there beforehand. So in the, in the face of all this uncertainty, what we do have, we have some, some advice, some guidelines from the Berlin Statement, which you've heard quite a bit about from this morning. And the, and the, the concept about return to play here is that it should be graduated, it should be stepwise, and it should be individualized. There's not one size fits all. A key thing to realize is that elite athletes shouldn't be treated any different than non-elite athletes. And for children, the Berlin Statement recommends return to learning first before returning to exercise. And in the, in the Berlin Statement, there are two tables showing the re graduated return to school or to learning and to return to play strategies. And I'm not going to go through these in detail now, but we'll use these as an example for return to play in a minute. And this is something you've got in your handout, which is a fantastic thing pr produced by Louis, which follows 
the Berlin Statement Return to Play guidelines. And the last thing I'd like to say is that clinical judgment shouldn't be used to shorten the return to play process, return to sport process. There's, there's no justification for saying, look, I think he's okay so he can return one or two days earlier. You can use that to delay things, but because we don't know when it is safe to return to play, my personal feeling is you need to stick rigidly to these guidelines because to go shorter than that without any knowledge of how safe it is, you're putting yourself and the athlete at risk. So Paul's going to say a few words now about um, decision making and ethics and then we're going to go to some case scenarios to hopefully bring some of the issues you're facing in the club. So I'm going to be quick because I think the, the important bit of this session is the seven or eight cases. But I want to start with a question and ask you, so how easy is it, do you think, to make a decision regarding concussion? Who says it's very easy? Hands up. Nobody. Who says it's a little bit easy? Nobody. One. Who says it's not difficult, not easy, so in between? A few. Difficult? Very difficult. And say nothing, a few. So, why is it towards nothing, not so difficult, not so easy, and difficult, would you think? What makes it slightly more difficult to make a decision in concussion? So, if, if you've managed a concussion next to the field, why is it difficult or not difficult? Yeah. Good. So, yeah. Perfect. So there's a very good point. If we do not concentrate on the game, so we don't know what's happened, yeah, that makes the decision difficult next to the field. So there's things that will go on, your position, etc., that will make it difficult. And Sure. The player is not aware. Very good. So the clinician next to the field might not be aware. The player might not be aware. Anything else that you've experienced next to the field? Coach? Aha. Coach manager. So what can we do in terms of decision making to avoid something like this? I think that we experience every week where there's a difference of opinion between role players when we need to make decisions. Yes? So that's one of the things that really make it difficult, uh, makes it difficult for us to reach a decision next to the field. I think another reason is because things happen quickly. So you don't know what, what happened. You, you don't necessarily have access to a, to a replay video that the audience on the other side of the um, world might have. So it makes it difficult. So what can we do to avoid this? And who has the final say? So let's hear about that. Who has the final say about concussion? Very good. Is the managers and the club management happy with that? Do they agree? No. Why? So, we have an important job to do together. And I think... Um, the emphasis was already on education. And I like the word education for different reasons, but education is extremely important. And we have to, in some other way, get club management on board. Yeah? So that will be one of the key things, I think, that we will all need to do together to help us to make better decisions. Now, yeah, please. Uh -huh. So we have to organize a bit of blood and uh, and and the people that. Sure. Yeah. 
So it's our choices that make us what we are. It's our choices, Harry, that show what we truly are, far more than our abilities. And this is, I think, very true. No? We've already dealt with on-field and diagnostic and factors that are important next to the field and that will make it difficult to get to a decision. Now, I want to ask the question, is there any room for shared decision making? And who needs to be in this equation of shared decision making in concussion? So if we already thought about the player who doesn't know what, what, what happened, the doctor or the physiotherapist that often also uh, didn't see what happened, yeah? and the manager who's just focused on the game. It is the recipe for chaos. Yeah? If we want to do shared decision making there next to the field. So I think one of the important things I want to say today is that <coughs> it's difficult to make a decision it's easier if we can make this shared decision making before we have blood and someone who drops on the field. So if we can get the role players around the table to share the decision and the management that we will do when stuff happens, I think that is one of the priorities for us to do together. Get the role players around the table and say, let's discuss. Let's try to meet each other and from that meeting point, we can come to a decision that we agree on together. So I think there's room for shared decision making, but not when the injury has already happened. Yeah? It becomes more difficult, I think, towards this side of the spectrum, management um, and return to play. Yeah? Um, uh, and we can go into that. So the problem with concussion is the cost and the risk is often really, uh, potentially very big. Yeah? If um, uh, to the clinician and, and to the player. Um, so we've dealt with that. The w probably the most important question that we need to answer to each other is what is the patient's capacity to make a rational decision? So when we discuss shared decision making, that is one of the key questions to answer. And in the, uh, in the framework of concussion, we can all agree, and I think the neuropsychologists will agree, that the capacity to make a decision is not there from the player's point of view. Yes? Who disagree? Is there anybody that disagree with that statement? No. In other words, what, what is the patient's opinion cannot be answered next to the field when the concussion has happened. But do you think it's reasonable to get the players and their opinions before they get concussed? on how do we all agree, these are the guidelines, how do we all agree to move forward? I think it's vital to get the team captain, the vice captain, etc., around the table and say, let's all now agree this is how we're going to move forward and get the players on board because they will be helping you to convince others as well, I think, and that's certainly my experience. You've all seen this and I don't want to go into this in too much detail, but the um, uh, Creighton's paper of 2010, if you haven't seen it, read it. I think it's a really key paper to be uh, um, aware of. And it's only really step one in concussion that's important. The uh, evaluation of, uh, of participation risk and the decision-making modifiers, so the importance of the game, etc., etc., in concussion is really not part of the guidelines. And this was a point that Dr. Louis made yesterday. Um, that's why we have that red circle around step two and three. In concussion, it's step one, and then follow the guidelines. So this is shared decision making, and you can read this paper in the British Journal that I've published, but there's really the athlete, the healthcare professionals, and the coach that should sit around a, a table, and there's different tools, et cetera, et cetera, when you, are, you have capacity in how you can make uh, decisions, and we're not going to go into that. If you want to read more, this is another paper by Elwin et al. discussing the process of shared decision making. Team talk, option talk, and followed by decision talk. One thing that I want to uh, mention here, and I'll re-emphasize that, is 
I think there's room for team talk before the concussion happens. At the beginning of a season, now we have the new guidelines. Let's sit around the table and discuss. There's not room for this when the injuries happen because of capacity and because of the urgency of, of, of uh, the matter that we need to deal with. So remember the injured athlete is your patient. All medical, ethical and clinical rules apply. Don't talk about a case or an athlete, it's a patient. I think that's uh, common sense to us all. If you act in the best interest of your patient, uh, it all falls into place. And pre-negotiate your role and your relationship with the manager and the players. And you'll make, uh, I think your job will be much, much easier. It's not so difficult to convince people when they sit around a table and we share our, op uh, our, our um, uh, knowledge and our worlds with each other to come to the best decision. Any questions before we go to uh, uh, the cases? I'll call Dr. Khalid. There'll be lots of discussion when we get to the cases. This is the first case. We have uh, sport <coughs> conclusions on Saturday, and uh, a player comes to see you on Sunday morning. And his question, doctor, when can I return to match play? So we have, we have to discuss this case. So open for discussion on the floor, so just ideas. How do you decide when he can return to play? No, so Sunday morning he comes to see you, he has no residual symptoms, although he did have some symptoms when you saw him last night, and clinical assessment is normal and scat is normal. Yeah, exactly. So we explain to the player that there is a, sp a specific protocol that we must follow it for his safety and if all the criteria uh, of the protocol uh, match the, the the proto protocol we have, so he came back to playing. Yeah. So, so using um, using the, the chart that Louis gave us based on the Berlin return to play guidelines, so if they're if he's so symptom free on Sunday morning, after 24 hours they can go on to stage one. And if you follow it through day by day, return to play as the following Saturday. So if things go really smooth, he's asymptomatic fairly soon after the injury, you can get them back within one week. Any disagreement with that? Okay, second case. Oh. So the second case is after <coughs> sport-related concussion on Saturday. The player comes to see you on Sunday, but he is still having some symptoms. Symptoms finally settle on Monday afternoon. After Monday afternoon, okay. It seems that all the symptoms has settled. When can the player return to play? So any comments or thoughts or questions?
Yeah, so I, th I think that's, as far as this session goes, I think that topic is slightly off topic, but I think I agree in, it entirely. The clinical assessment is really important, and you have to uh, manage them appropriately clinically. So this session is about the return to play. So assume you've done everything right on the Sunday when you've seen them. They've come back to see you now. It's Monday afternoon, yeah. and the symptoms have settled. So assuming that the symptoms are settled, uh, uh, the rest of the clinical assessment is normal, so you, you're happy they're now asymptomatic. How do you decide when they return to play? Yeah, so basically, exactly the same as before, let's follow that. Yep. Hold on, so it's two. Yeah, so it's the Sunday. Okay, so they can return. Yeah. So basically, you start from stage, the first stage, and as in the guidelines, you, you progress one stage every 24 hours, as long as they've successfully completed that stage. If they don't complete the stage, they go back 24 hours and wait and then start again. So this is assuming, obviously, that they go through the stages without any complications. I think no matter the situation, the, the picture is to sit with the patient, take your, our time, and education. Explain what's going on and what are the steps to follow up from the beginning. If your symptoms are still after 24 hours without any kind of impairment, we are going to do this. Uh, any kind of these steps, um, after 24 hours, we can go forward. If not, have to go back and go step by step. Yeah, well, I think communication here is the key, and I think what Paul said to start with, the most effective communication is pre-season. So if everyone understands it, is on board and has agreed to it, then it makes it much easier to, to, to manage. And the players need to be across this as well. Can I ask a quick question? I think it's true, so pre-season it's, it's quite important. But is there any um, team uh, or management medical team and player debriefing, for instance, after an injury? Is that happening at club level at all? So for instance, say there is a severe concussion, the patient recovers and, or the player recovers and he's back on the field. Is there any way that there's a debriefing discussion about how that was managed? Or is that not really happening? Mm -hmm. So that's another thing to consider because it, I think there's good evidence that if you sit with a patient, sit with, a, uh, with an athlete and coach in a debriefing situation after an injury, you can learn a lot on, on how can we improve in, in, in future, future management. So pre-season and during the season, I think. I want to ask another question uh, to, to everybody here. So this is a very difficult uh, return to play protocol to put into practice in elite football. Um, is this possible? Will that happen? Or will somebody be overruled somewhere or take a shortcut? I faced that situation once. And um, when, when you ask if the, dis the decision was very difficult, maybe I said no, because our, our responsibility is the, in the health of the player. If maybe you want to take the risk with a muscle injury, with a ligament injury, okay, you call the player and you call the coach, this is the situation, there is a risk. If we want to take the risk together, but the consequences of a neurological issue like this, are you going to take the responsibility, the coach or the player? It's me. It's me who is going to sign the discharge. And we cannot know what is going to be the result if we, maybe with uh, the clinical judgment, no, I feel good. I think I can play. The president of the club, the directors, everybody was calling me. We need the player for the weekend. No, we have one protocol. I'm not going to sign. For me, it was easier at that moment. So protocols and guidelines can make decision making for us all easier. Yes? Is that is that your message? No? If we apply a, a, a world class protocol or guideline, it can make our decision making easier.
So maybe it will be easier for us and uh, if the staff don't agree what we do, if they want to play against medical advice, what will be our position? So legally, if you don't sign, you are not responsible for what he is doing or the, the coach is doing because you did, you refused. You are f uh, following this protocol. You didn't sign the discharge, but you assume that maybe you will have some <laughs> complications with the management. But this is our, our real life. We have sometimes to take some difficult decisions. We go to share, for you, uh, uh, to share with you one small experience like this, but in the field, we have an injury concussion in the, in the field in 45 minutes exactly. And the time when we go in the field to check the player, the, the referee uh, 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 faint the first half and we go to the, to the, to the restroom the decision in the first five minutes that the player is to change. And the player was agree with this decision. And we are uh, uh, playing Champions League in, in Asia, football team. After f this five minutes, there is, there is some sign of concussion. That you mean headache, little imbalance, uh, trouble of vision. That all we go for the decision. After five minutes, you go to the bathroom, speak with the coach the coach come for me why why you make him outside he go to play in this moment I want to ask here the, the presence what is the decision to take we take the decision no okay for me this player for me I not go to advise him to come back in the field but the player come back in the field and if after five minutes he stop and do, don't want to continue in this moment, the coach say for me, uh, Doctor, see. I say for him, no, no you now to, uh, have to see, not me. <laughs> that means it's really difficult also when um, it's uh, OK here, we can discuss easier. But in the field, when we have pressure, when we have important game, important player in national team, it's not easy to take the decision. We take it, but sometime with not, not easier. That's a very good comment, and that illustrates the difficulty in the real world of, of making the right decision. Yeah. So I think if you're in the on-field situation, you do have one other possible ally if the coach isn't playing ball, is the referee. So I've used the referee in the past to say he's concussed and the referee's asked him to be removed from the field of play. Now that may not happen in football, but certainly in rugby it, it will do. Now that's, that's the situation, and I, I, I feel in the same way as Dr. Faisal, and, and I, like, I like his last comment that the coach needs to take the decision. But anyway, this is the problem where we, if you're working in the football where you're constantly facing this issue, you're not um, guided by the rules and nobody is, is, is forced these rules to the, uh, to the whole uh, play of football. If you're gonna do that, then it makes it much, much easier. Because we all know that it's, um, that is a critical situation, it can be a critical situation. We know that, but we are the only one. So we need to educate, that's what we start for, educate, and hopefully FIFA will make these rules next year uh, commonly, and then we can, we can just act by the rules. But at the moment it's difficult, and then you're constantly, this kind of things happens. So, yeah, but it's good that we are, proactive, knowing that this is coming up, knowing what, uh, th that we have the knowledge about this concussion, and then in the future maybe the rest will follow. Um, Next case. Oh. Please. Um, there was a question who uh, has the final uh, decision? And everybody here said the doctor. Yes, medically it should be like this. But in uh, in real situation, or the question should be, who has the right, who is decide about the substitution of the player? And the answer will be the coach. Then finally, medical decision, okay, the doctor, but 
the practical decision to replace a player is the coach. And if we go to the referee and we say, referee, you, 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 should, you should not accept this player to play because he has a problem, then in this uh, uh, situation you will uh, work against the interest of the club and uh, your situation in the club will not be uh, good because you are uh, working uh, against the interest of the club. Uh, this is my comment. Yeah. So, um, I, I completely agree and I think it's very difficult. I've been in exactly the same situation where you know what's the right thing to do and it's just about impossible to make it happen because you don't have the support of the coach. Having said that, we have to remember, I think, that of, as everybody has mentioned already, our first responsibility is towards the player. So you have to do whatever you can to protect that player, especially when they're concussed and they can't, they can't make a decision. with They don't have the capacity to make a good decision. Then the second responsibility is towards yourself. So in, in a funny way, your career is always more important than your job. So if you make a mistake, if you let somebody go back willingly and you're willing to sign because the coach is forcing you, you could sacrifice your career in a way. If you don't, you might sacrifice your job. But <laughs> there's always another one, you know what I mean? In the end, we have to do what is the right thing for the player and what is the right thing for you. And the really nice thing about these guidelines is that it is universally accepted. These are the world experts who have come up with these guidelines. FIFA supports it. Before every major FIFA competition, these guidelines are discussed with every coach who is involved with every match in every major FIFA competition, as well as the club or the, the team physicians, as well as the referees. So if you make a decision like that and your club coach doesn't agree, he's going against the rest of the football world. So let him take the responsibility. And if you stick to this, you protect it. But, but even, even if he, he is the one who took the responsibility, after that, the media, maybe FIFA even, they will blame the doctor. How the doctor allowed him. And you cannot... Uh, 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 relate all the story that uh, happened in the changing room. We cannot, uh, it yeah. and finally, the doctor will accept this blame and say, "Okay, I will not repeat my mistake, but it was not his." Mistake. I, I understand, and I, I agree. You know, the w uh, people often get um, crucified by the media when they don't really know what happened. But I guess the only. The only thing you can do in that situation is on the day to document everything and to make sure that maybe the media will crucify you, but what can you do? I mean, you can't prevent that. But at least from a medical legal point of view, you can protect yourself by documenting exactly what happened, what you said, what the coach said, the fact that you refused to let the player go back, and then the decision was taken by others. That's the best you can do, I think. And we have an example, sorry, uh, just to, uh, in the Uruguay, England in 2014, yeah. we. Everybody, millions of people saw that the player refused to uh, the substitution, but after that, the doctor was blamed by FIFA, Medical Commission of FIFA. And yeah, but I think this is, is going on, and the FIFA is giving support to the doctor. And they will give the referee instruction that the final decision ha has to come from the doctor. Yeah. So it will be a great support for the the field practitioner i think i, I think like say dr uh, stefan that uh, that the, the the referee will will be more involved to take the decision by by the doctor same maybe in the rugby because in the football it's not easy sometimes when to take a decision especially when there is low low grade of concussion in the field maybe this emphasizes the point that especially in football where the rules are vague and people are reluctant to follow uh, proper guidelines, um, the, the work is in the prevention of these situations. So it is to pre-negotiate your decision making with, with your manager, maybe discuss concussion management before a match with the, with the referee and just do some work beforehand. The, the more people are on the same page, the easier this is going to be. Uh, in, in my opinion and in my experience as well. And believe you me, you're not alone. This happens all over the world. 
I, I think what you what you what you plan this to make a discussion before this in in football possible in one season you have one or two conclusions that you mean there is not so much frequency but maybe in the other sports like rugby or there is more frequent it's possible to plan this kind of precision discussion but for football you go for the coach or for the management to discuss this I think is not uh, uh, so this is the case of a football player sustained a bump on the head during a match. He completed the match. Three hours after the injury, he's complaining of headache. He has no other symptoms of concussion. Does he have concussion or not? Who says yes? Who says no? We've got four answers so far. Who says don't know? We cannot know. <laughs> so how to know? Okay, so you've assessed them, and the only thing, you, you assess the player. Okay, hold, so you, you assess the player. Scat is totally normal. Scat test is totally normal. He has, he has no other symptoms apart from a headache, a generalized headache that lasts three hours after the game, after a bang on the head. Is this, a you know, is this a concussion or not? Because what happens after that hinges upon the diagnosis of concussion. So once you've made that diagnosis, you follow the graduated return to play process. So making the d diagnosis is, is, becomes the important bit. Case. Oh, we're, 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 oh. So we haven't come to a conclusion here. Okay, so we're, we're, we'll have a vote here. So everyone's got to vote, one with the other. There's going to be one, three options. Who thinks this guy has definitely not been concussed? Okay. Who thinks the guy has been concussed? And who's still undecided? So still about half people didn't vote. Okay, so at the moment, <coughs> the, the Berlin consensus states that any one symptom can make a diagnosis of concussion. So those who said yes uh, were right. And unfortunately, then we stuck with the, with the, with the situation where we have to go through the, um, the return to play protocol, which will be a very difficult thing to sell in your club, I understand. But according to evidence-based guidelines, one headache is sufficient to diagnose concussion. Yeah, obviously combined with a blow to the head and associated with the headache. So even if there is no, no sign, if we have a doubt, we have to, uh, to check the player. Even without a sign. If we have a doubt, we remove the player. Yeah, so, so concussion could be symptoms or signs or both. You don't have to have signs as such. So a headache is a symptom of concussion. Obviously, there are other causes of headache, but this is following a blow to the head. It's not, a, it's not painful where he's been hit. It's the generalized headache. Uh, I have a question. Uh, yes. During the last four seasons in the QSA, there was 10 concussions. Approximately, if we take the exposure uh, for the four, four last years, it concerned the majority of the teams of the first and second division. We had 10 uh, cases of concussion, but of course, much more trauma on the head. Do you think there was an underestimation or just uh, since it's a rare injury in football? I suspect it's un under recognition and under reporting. It's interesting with, with the rugby, once they've got much more diligent with their concussion diagnosis and management, the, the, the rates of concussion went up quite a lot. So I, th I think a, a, a lot of cases, it's unrecognized. But uh, what the exact rate is, I don't know. Let's be honest. I think majority of us, before, 
we will, we, we will not speak about concussion for this player, if we are honest. Yeah, that is true. So, um, as Steve has said, uh, concussion has been underreported and, uh, and the, the, the prevalence increased after implementation of programs like this, so we're expecting this. And as far as the Qatar, the 10 uh, concussions uh, is concerned, so uh, Dr. Cristiano, uh, I think, and together with Steve and a few others, published a paper on, on this to say that it's much lower than the international rate in elite football. So they, uh, uh, they suspect that uh, there's a, a serious underreporting and that something like this should be put into place. Um. For each head uh, uh, contact or head injury, there will be a localized head pain. Should we have to differentiate between local head pain, maybe, and headache? Yes. And how to do it? Because when you ask the player, if you have, do you have pain, uh, 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 pain on the head? He will say yes. You understand? Because it's almost the same term in Arabic. Yeah, I, I appreciate that, that it is difficult, um, but if you can try and get across that is, is it just pain about where you've been hit or more of a generalized headache? And I know Arabic doesn't necessarily translate very neatly into how I think in English. Um, and it's challenging, you know, medicine is challenging. It's not all black and white, there are grays. But if, if, if you can try and make that distinction, as best you can, that's all you can do.